Welcome everyone, Costine here with a discussion about Thrones of Decay, which has finally gotten its announcement trailer. And based on certain information we do have out there, whether or not it will be true, we don't know. Uh, but we do also have a release date. It's going to be coming out by the end of this, this month, unless something does change. But apparently people leaked a bunch of information like unit cards uh, that are on Reddit at the moment, and apparently the release date has also been leaked. But until we get a full confirmation from Creative Assembly, I'm not going to really dive into that, though I do certainly hope it does come out before the end of this particular month. But let's talk about what they're adding in Thrones of Decay. And I want to start this by talking about the value proposition. So they're changing the way they're doing DLC pricing, and the way they're doing so is that they're going to split the DLC in three parts, each is going to be more expensive than many other DLCs, but you do get the discount on the second part. So if you just want to buy Tarmarkun, yeah, that might be more expensive than in previous DLCs, but if you buy all of it, it's roughly the same price that we had for Shadows Change and Forge of the Cast Dwarves. Now, for me, from a value proposition, what's going to make or break the DLC is whether or not these races, the Empire, the Dwarves, and Nurgle, and something I've stated multiple times in the past, is going to be the racial reworks. Because these three races all need racial reworks. The Empire needs to get rid of Imperial Authority. Pronto, Nurgle, geez, what does Nurgle not need? A better economy, better recruitment system, better building system. It's like the entire damn package over there. Like, Nurgle needs a lot of work. And yes, the dwarves need to work as well. Though with the dwarves a bit less so than the others, in the sense that what the dwarves really need is casualty replenishment. It can be a hero, it can be faction-wide. Sure, it would be great to get like a caravan system or you know some material system, some resource system, like the cast dwarves have, though adapted for the dwarves. I mean, you have a perfectly good dwarf system over there with the cast dwarves, just adapted for the regular dwarves. Use elf gold and something other than exploiting a forge. Fix the forge so we're not just exploiting it. Like, this is the problem with things like Imperial Authority and the forge. It's not just that they're bad systems. It's like they're exploitable systems as well. So fixing that, it's not just like, oh, we want to make it better. No, we want to close the gaps. Or we want to close the exploits because abusing Imperial Authority to just by just taking a settlement, selling it over and over again to get the event, that's not particularly great. Regardless, that's where I stand. I'm not necessarily so much interested in new units, new lords, or anything like that. I'm interested in the question, are these races going to be fun to play? And not just for the new legendary lords, but for the race as, as a whole, because I don't care necessarily if Elspeth is going to be great. I care if the Empire is going to be great to play from this point onward. And there are certain things that are going to matter in terms of like baseline game mechanics, like range combat, for instance, that are going to be very significant from my perspective, beyond just like racial mechanics. But regardless of that, let's take a look at the DLC situation and what they're offering. So first, let's start with Tamarkun. Thrones of the King introduces Tamarkun, the Maggot Lord. And he looks like an ogre, but he's not an ogre. He's a worm that's inside the war ogre so he's controlling that ogre apparently the ogre doesn't reduces his intellect so apparently tamarkan suffers from that i wonder if we're going to be able to swap bodies with tamarkan because that's kind of the, his thing in the lore regardless uh we also get unique mechanics new campaign realms the castle that kind of stuff i wonder if we're going to get new campaign mechanics for immortal empires because with testos one of the things they did right is you could play the narrative campaign in immortal empires now, I do feel if they do give us that choice, it should be a choice. Because let me just say that doing all those quest battles every single campaign as a Stankia yeah, or the Changeling kind of gets tiring very, very quickly. It's much better as Yanbo, mind you, in that respect. So, you gather chieftains from powerful factions across the known world, become the ultimate warlord of Nurgle as Tamarkin, one of the first to flock to your banners, a new legendary hero, Kaisk the Befouled, who's... Apparently, so he's a warrior of chaos of Nurgle who is really fallen into the corruption. He's kind of like just basically one step away from a chaos bond, but he's not a chaos bond. But he's pretty much going in that direction, let's just call it there. Uh, you get Chaos Lord of Nurgle and Chaos Sorcerer of Nurgle to reinforce the Grand There's Frong as a new lord and hero choices. I imagine obviously this is going to affect Warrior's Cast pretty good, fixes the, some of the missing roster options over there. 
and obviously gonna help Nurgle itself as a race. Five new units, three regiments are now, so this is going to be a case. We get five new units for each race, we get a lord, we get a hero, we get regiments right now. That's how the, this is. So every race, getting five units, a lord, a hero. That's across the board. He's one of the greatest chaos warlords to ever afflict the known world, a mighty leader to some, a bloated corpse worm to others. Those that stand against Tamar can quickly fall under the banner of his bringer of desolation. A heart-hitting tank and that rides a, uh, atop a unique toad dragon. Okay, that's going to be interesting. And a crusade. Now, I mentioned this crusade aspect because I'm kind of wondering how this is going to be. Is it going to be quest battles to get these chieftains? Because, like, that's one going to be going to be the main things that you're going to do like there's unit cards on reddit that people have posted or someone has posted are you going to have quest battles for these guys which probably would be the better option is it going to be just some mechanic that you do without a quest bell and you just have to get you know some objective done or do you have to literally go into a particular point of the world to get x thing which would be kind of similar to how you do with books and a guy traveling around the world, which would be really annoying. That said, Tamarkan should be on a journey. The reason I say that is, if you look at his lore, he fought Drazov, and then Drazov basically agreed, you know what, we're both chaos, let's go fight the Empire. So Drazov, with his vast and powerful army, joined Tamarkan to fight the Null. Tamarkan lost, Drazov abandoned him, that's essentially what happened. Elspeth beat the crap out of him. That's the lore. And then you also have the Nemesis Crown, which it's not listed in an official article, but one of the things Creative Assembly does say is that, yes, we're going to have the Nemesis Crown, we're going to have free um, free content, free DLC. I hate the FLC uh, acronym. We're going to have free DLC for uh, for the game. And we're going to have major racial reworks. And based on what Great Book of Grudges has stated in his video, he's been told that these are substantial racial reworks. I am kind of wondering if Tarmarkan is going to be a horde army or if he's going to have proper settlements, like similar to how Kugaf has. I guess we'll see. Either one could work, but I'm kind of... The way I could read this, this description over here, he could very well be a horde army. Let me just say that playing Nurgle, the race, is not fun at all at the moment. Sure, some people will argue otherwise. I'm just going to say it. It's like every poll I've done, and every poll pretty much anyone has done, shows that Nurgle is one of the most unpopular, if not the most unpopular race in the game at the moment. Which is important for a DLC, because that this is one of the things Creative Assembly is trying to fix. But I hope it's not the Changeling situation, because the Changeling's a decision did not work because like you can make a unique campaign mechanic if the baseline race is not particularly great just the fact you make the made the unique mechanic and a horde army well the changeling ended up being very boring for a lot of people so we'll see how they decide to handle that but i think you do want people to have control over settlements there's so much tied to that then you have malachi who may also be a horde faction so malachi my concern a slayer engineer now he's a Lore character, friends of Gotrick and Felix, and I do wonder with this campaign, because we did see Gotrick and Felix in the trailer, what I am very much wondering in this particular campaign, could we potentially get Gotrick and Felix permanent as proper heroes or a lord for Gotrick in a campaign as opposed to them just being temporary? Because I think it would very much suit Malachi's campaign. Or maybe CA is saving that for later. I want to bring up something very interesting about Malachi. So you got the Spirit of Grungni, which is a massive Thunder Barge. Like, Thunder Barges are big. Like, pretty big. Uh, Spirit of Grungni is not like a Zeppelin. It's kind of like, I don't know, a flying fortress, <laughs> essentially, of, uh, of, a, of a power. I don't think we necessarily saw it in the trailer. I'm curious if we're going to have it available in battles or if it's just going to give army abilities i'm really curious about that but the way i'm reading this this is going to probably be uh you're pro you may not be a horde army but you're certainly going to have mobility now interesting thing about malachi is that he gotrick and felix they just kind of go went on a tour of the cast wait using the spirit of Grogni. The way they did that, the way it's explained in the lore, unlike in the game, the castways is supposed to be an absolute nightmare to navigate demons, craziness, and all that, but they flew above it. And then they landed in, an, in basically the equivalent of Moria in the Warhammer universe. 
saved some dwarves, basically, if, let's say, the Fellowship arrived in Moria much earlier. That's kind of what Matt, like I, Gotrick, and Felix did. Saved a couple of dwarves, saved the, the treasure, then they're abandoned and fought a bunch of demons. I'm really curious if that's going to be the case here. And I really do wonder if it, you're going to have a campaign dedicated to where these guys are fighting each other. So, obviously, Els Elspeth and Malachi fighting uh, Tamarkun which would work, but I also am really curious to see if maybe a part of the campaign that he has, at least in Realms of Chaos, if not Immortal Empires, and honestly, there's no saving Realms of Chaos unless the map is significantly changed. Like, it could be resolved. Like, it would be great to have a more limited campaign, but it's like the RSC map is just really bad. So, really curious about that, because I think that would be an epic journey. Uh, so, we get the Spirit of Grungi, Mobile Workshop, Transport Vessel, okay? We're going to be constructing stuff over there based on uh, based on looks of things. We get Garagrim Ironfrist. This is Ungrim's son, who basically wanted to end the Slayer curse, or the Slayer debt, not curse, the Slayer debt that his entire family line owed. And so he became a Slayer to basically wipe away the shame. He died, and then Ungrim took another Slayer off. So mission accomplished. Mission failed successfully, I suppose, because Ungram took an oath, another Slayer oath, after he died. Storm Chaos and End Times, all that. And yeah, five new units, Generic Lord, Generic Hero, and further three regiments of renown. And then it's his whole slay, uh, Slayer story. So he's an engineer with a freaking shotgun that's also a Slayer. Now, he's a range support character, which is very questionable from my perspective. Let me explain why. The way well, virtually every hero, range hero and lord works right now, unless they're on a mount, and I'm not sure he's gonna have a mount, maybe he'll be flying around that thunder barge, which, whatever, uh, if that's the case, it's like, he's not a hero in combat, he's basically a freaking death machine in the skies, that would work, but the problem with them on foot, and this applies to every hero and every lord, the leaf and all that, is that when Warhammer 3, especially, not Warhammer 2, and Warhammer 2, they work a lot better, but on foot, they struggle so much to get a lot of shots off. When they do, they do a lot of damage. But in mobile battles, in, in engagements with close lines, it's really difficult for them to do any damage, so that makes them kind of useless. This is not the case in Warhammer 2. Like, play Warhammer 2 as a Leaf and R. You'll see the guy just smashing things. And of course, he's less effective if he's trying to shoot behind the lines, but he can, whereas the problem in Warhammer 3, the way range combat works, that limits it. This is going to be very important for both the Dwarves and Empire. Our Creative Assembly going to fix the range combat, because it is pretty broken right now, and it has been broken for a long time. I think there was a portion of Warhammer 3 where it worked better, though maybe a bit too broken, and then they backtrack on that, made it far worse. I just gotta say it, the way the range combat feels, the way units can shoot, yes, there's friendly fire in Warhammer 2, I'll take the freaking friendly fire in Warhammer 2 versus, like, my ranged units and heroes and lords especially not doing anything. It's especially bad, as I stated, for lords and heroes. Like, if I'm playing on a Leaf on R campaign, I'm not relying on a Leaf on R doing any freaking damage in battle, at best I'm using him as a distraction, running around the battlefield using his clone, his shadow clone, to do something, and... That's kind of the problem that you have, especially if he's a shotgunner, because that's that's where we're going to get into the units, because we know what units are going to be coming out. We have the unit cards, we also have their names. But I guess we'll see. So we're going to have nine unwinnable battles and fight one mighty foe, so I'm guessing there's going to be some quest battles like that. And to atone for sins, he sees it as an opportunity to learn new tricks, advance his equipment, and crush all that stand before him. So... Maybe a unit customization over here. That's kind of how it sounds like over here with Malachi. A mobile recruitment base. Whether or not you have settlements or not, that's the question. But probably individual unit you know, customization. I'm kind of reminded... Like, I wonder if they're going to take a similar mechanic to what Fraud has for a one. Great mechanic, by the way. And just give it to Malachi. Now, some people are going to cry foul if they do that, but I'm like, it's a great freaking mechanic. They should use it for more than just one character. Like, like there's so many great mechanics that only apply to one legendary lord or another, and it's like, why don't more use them? Like, I understand uniqueness, I understand, like, making DLC worth it, but I do feel like these kind of mechanics should be more widespread. That's my personal perspective on the subject. I know some people are going to disagree, but, it, like, I would like, uh, like some 
like I would like more people to have like frauds customization, obviously adapted for the race we're talking about, right? As opposed to the mutation, like just better equipment, for instance. And I wonder if this is going to apply to the dwarves in general to some extent. Um, and then we have to talk about Elspeth. And for the Empire, we have Elspen von Draken, who is kind of cosplaying as Katrin in some way. That's, that's how people have described her to an extent in terms of how she looks. So a new legendary lord for the Empire, usable in both R.C. and Immortal Empires. Sorcery, wisdom when lords, heroes, and units to enhance your campaign roster on the battlefield. Unique campaign mechanics to the Empire, bearing in mind what I said earlier that... Apparently, they're doing major racial reworks. We'll see major racial updates regardless, substantial ones. So you embrace the strength of magic uh, of magic and gunpowder of Noel's Imperial Gunnery School. You purchase exclusive and powerful units by unlocking the Amethyst Armory. That reminds me of kind of like the Tomb Kings mechanic where you can kind of get like some unique units or maybe really it's kind of similar to Eka Claw, I suppose, or a crossover between the two of them. Like, you know, you get certain upgrades, you get a couple of unique units that like that. That's what you do in Eka Claw's campaign. Great mechanic, should be used more. Hopefully they, that's exactly what I'm uh, referring to, what they're referring to over here. Travel instantly between friendly settlements with the Gardens of Moor. So that's her unique mechanic. She can build these gardens where she can teleport, not for free, and not without a cooldown. So more similar perhaps to the Wood Elves and their trees that you can create your own. Um, and then you get uh, Fyodor Bruckner, Hound of Judgment, the Skill Fighter, who was the one who technically killed Tamarkan. Like, Elspeth gave him a medal, a medallion. He fought Tamarkan, was protective thanks to Amidalion. He died fighting gloriously against Tamarkan, but yeah, like Fyodor is a big part of that story against uh, Tamarkan. Um, respect the advisor to the Electric Counts and instrumental at keeping the plagues of Nurgle at bay. So she's only going to be clashing with Tamarkan. I'm curious about Malachi. We'll see how that goes down. Magistrix of the Amid. Amethyst Order, the Graveyard Rose may be all that stands in the Maggot's Lord way. Powerful spellcaster, she soars across the skies on her Carmine Dragon with the strong helping of magical mastery under her belt. What, um, and her alliance with Nuln has allowed her to help support the forces of the Empire in a unique may, uh, way. True potential of Empire's gunpowder units can be unleashed with Nuln's Imperial Gunnery Skull. Makes sense, if you're gonna have a DLC focused on Elspeth versus Tamarkin, you're gonna have a lot of gunpowder units. To do this, Magic and Black Empire can no longer be separate entities and instead must work together to ensure the forces of Chaos are kept at bay. I can just imagine the dwarves being horrified. You want to combine magic and guns? Oof. What heresy are you embracing over there? And her patronage will go a long way to, uh, to developing the next stage of technological advancements as she also offers her unique talents to combine mastery of death magic into munitions of the Imperial Gunnery Scroll, creating a combined arms force of amethyst units with the foes the foes of the Empire will regret crossing. And I'm kind of curious, because, like, she gets those five units, but I'm also curious, like, reading on this, if she's going to get, like, unique units, like, some great sword, some infantry. Because uh, we do have the unit roster for stuff. It's been posted all over the place, but I'm going to use PC Gamer's article over here. So let's first talk about Nurgle. So the Maggot Lord gets Kaz the Befouled. Talked about him, basically, a cast ball, or more or less. Though not the spawn kind of between a warrior of chaos and a spawn the way i'm reading his lore cat lord cast lord cast sorcerer plague ogres rot knights toad dragons pestigors and bile trolls so trolls of nurgle gores of nurgle toad dragons rot knots and plague ogres so plague ogres what's interesting it's not they're they're not just ogres of nurgle there's also a great weapon variant which is pretty interesting to consider because Consider ogre bulls for the ogres. One of the problems they have is they don't have a great weapon variant. Maybe an idea for a future DLC or free LC or whatever. But plague ogres. And we know Epidemius is the free stuff. Like, that's what people have stated, by the way. Including uh, certain YouTubers. So I'm not... Like, I don't actually know what's in the DLC. Like, beyond the articles. Just pointing this out. But plague ogres with the great weapon variant. Yeah, that's going to be pretty scary. I mean, ogres obviously do have a two-handed weapon variant, but it's still for units, kind of expensive. But imagine ogre bulls. That would be a really cost-effective unit. So maybe you won't rely on 
Chaos Warriors or Nurgle will gray weapons quite as much. We'll see. And also the one benefit of, about this, like Ogres current are have Wall Breaker, right? So understand the potential here in a campaign. You have a unit that has Wall Breaker opening fronts, and that's really, really damn powerful. And of course, trolls are also really good for sieges, so bile trolls, even better. Especially if they have stronger leadership than regular trolls. But then we have Malachi over here. So dwarves get Demon Slayer, Dragon Slayer, Doom Seeker, Goblin Hewer, Thunder Barge, Grudge Raker, Thunderers, and Slayer Pirates. So you get several units of Slayers. Like this is not the engineering DLC for dwarves. This is the Slayer DLC for dwarves. And I really wonder with this unit list, Hero, uh, hero and Lord, whether or not this is really going to make Ungram actually good. Because Ungram right now is the worst dwarf legendary lord to play but because slayers are just not worth using in a dwarf army essentially quarreler gr quarreler grudge thrower combination is so much better than anything else that even for ungram's own personal army you don't give a damn about slayer they take too many casualties you don't have good casualty replenishment i mean ungram does have better casualty replenishment but why would, why would you get slayers you get better better resolve with quarrelers you get much better battle result with Quarrelers, you take far fewer casualties with quarrelers. You can you have a lot more flexibility than with slayers. So I'm really, really curious to see what they've done with slayers and if these new units are really gonna help Ungram out in a particular fashion. Now, Demon Slayer, like you gotta understand the tiers of slayers. You got some of the lowest tiers of slayers, things like troll slayers, then you get things like giant slayers and all that, dragon slayers, demon slayer. Gotrek is a demon slayer. Well, he is the demon slayer. So demon slayers are absurdly good slayers. Like, they're nigh on unkillable. So I'm kind of hoping the demon slayer is going to give Ungram in particular, and I'm wondering if he's going to get better faction effects for slayers because he doesn't have them. Um, but one of the things that a demon slayer lord could give would be like, various benefits for slayers in particular things like physical resistance not armor physical resistance like you consider the savage orcs Warzak has he can have physical resistance for them in his army which is kind of the way this should be handled like slayers yeah they shouldn't wear armor lore reasons but they shouldn't just die on the battlefield they should be really really hard to kill actually <laughs> despite the fact they're not wearing armor it's not like slayers just die on mass that's one of the problems with them so hopefully a Demon Slayer will provide that. Hopefully Ungrim will uh, will provide that. Or maybe Demon Slayers could use some combination of um, Journey's End, Ward Save, Physical Resistance, one of those things, right? I guess Ward Save would make sense, right? Uh, Doom Seekers, we'll see what kind of unit. They are a Slayer unit, based on the unit cards I've seen. Um, certainly Slayer Pirates. So Slayer Pirates are One Hand and Pistol. That's what Slayer Pirates are. <laughs> I kind of wonder, like, I haven't read the lore on these. Like, I know there are Slayer Pirates. Probably that freaking fleet of Barak Var is going to get a lot of these guys. But I'm kind of wondering, how do you justify being a Slayer Pirate in the lore? That's just, I don't know. Regardless. Um, Thunder Barge, yeah. Flying um, uh, airship. Airship with guns. So think of what Cafe has. Just put that. Now, the thing I'm reading a lot here, though... Like, some of the units that you have in the DLC seem like very high-tier units. I'm hopeful there's going to be some stuff that's accessible earlier on, even in limited quantities. This is what I like about the cast orders. You can get some really powerful units early on in campaign, but they're limited in capacity. And later on, you can get as many of them as you want. Getting them early on is good because it's really the early game that's the meat of any campaign on any difficulty. That's one of the most challenges. So I'm really hopeful that they just have that. I really hope they haven't just added a bunch of tier four, tier five units because that's gonna suck. Like, I mean, obviously some of these things are gonna be tier two, tier three, but all the same. Uh, Grudge Raker Thunderers. So these guys are the equivalent of blunderbusses. So cast or blunderbusses for regular dwarves. Now, some people like I was reading comments on Reddit, and I do hate that Reddit meta to be specific, but. Some people were saying things along the lines, well, I wouldn't recruit any other unit. Uh, you would. Like, you don't go with blunderbuss, just pure blunderbusses in Chaos Dwarf campaign. It's not just because of the unit capacity. It's not effective. Uh, like, the Quarreler Doomstack... Like, if I had Quarrelers at Chaos Dwarfs, I would not get any Gunpowder unit, to be blunt about it. Like, Gunpowder units suck right now in Warhammer 3. Or I'd get a couple. 
Like, that's the thing. Like, when you're playing a dwarf campaign, you might get a couple of Iron Drakes, a couple of Thunderers. That's what you're going to do with Grudge Rake Thunderers. You're not going to build an entire stack of them. You might, but it's not effective. It's more effective to have a lot more armies and get Quarrelers because they can deal with the vast majority of threats. Something like a shotgunner unit is going to be very situational. They're not going to be great in necessarily uh, tight spots where they might just not shoot or they're going to struggle to shoot. They would be great on a field battle where you can maneuver behind the enemy once the lines are engaged and, you know, just blast them to pieces. That's how blunderbusses work very, very effectively. But yeah, um, it's going to, it will be a great unit if they're a shotgun or thunderer, like the blunderbusses basically. But, of course, there's going to be, they're going to be situational. Like, I don't see anything in this roster that's going to replace the Quarreler, necessarily. You might have the possibility of going full-on Slayers, especially as Ungrim, assuming he gets better faction effects and all that. Uh, but still, like, I'm not seeing here, like, unless they make some major sweeping changes with the way Slayers work and the way Casualty Replenishment works. And even then, even if Casualty Replenishment is given to Dwarves, you still wouldn't want, you still wouldn't necessarily want to go full on. Though it will probably, like, all the stuff they're adding here will make a melee army, a Slayer army more viable. Don't get me wrong, like, just the variety of units going to work fairly well. And then we get... Uh, Elspeth uh, stuff, so beef up units with upgrades and powerful abilities, okay. All they need to do is deal damage. Uh, they'll learn schematics that can be swapped for boons, so it, it will be interesting. So unit customization over there. Like if we read over here. Um, so uh, so Malachite seems like he's going to have, uh, his focus is going to be upgrading the warship based on what PC Gamer is saying based on the informational package they got from CA. Whereas Elspeth is probably going to be more about the individual unit customization. A bit weird. Probably should be the other way around, but regardless. Um, uh, the Empire gets Master Engineer, Engineer, Marienburg, Landship, Steam Tank, Volley, Null Iron Sights, Hawkland, Rock, uh, Long Rifles, and Knights of the Black Rose. Okay. So we get arranged gunpowder hero, a range gunpowder lord, a land ship, a hell blaster volleygun attached to a steam tank, two individual units of hand gunners, basically variants of them with different strengths, all that, and Knights of the Black Rose. Uh, let me say this, uh, like I pray there are significant changes in the way gunpowder units work in this, because like, obviously, an engineer hero is going to be great, right? Mobility. Like, he's probably going to get mobility, right? Like, I'm wondering if the Dragon Slayer is going to have casual... He should, or there should be a campaign mechanic uh, where his dwarves can get casualty replenishment, how Chaos Dwarves work. Like, Chaos Dwarves don't have casualty replenishment from a hero. They have casualty replenishment faction-wide for various benefits. Research tree, all that kind of stuff that they can access pretty quickly. Uh, but I really, really do wonder with the Empire... Like, I really hope gunpowder units are going to work a lot better because, ooh, you added uh, two new units of gun, uh, two new units of handgunners, you've added an engineer hero, you've added a master engineer, and also, like, a lot of the stuff, like, especially for the Empire, really seems focused, like, on Tier 4, Tier 5. Who knows, maybe they have redesigned the Empire building tree where so you can actually get things like cannons at Tier 2, which you should... Maybe you can get handgunners gunners earlier on. Maybe you can get, uh, maybe you can get like steam tanks earlier on because like just having a lot of this seems like tier four, tier five to be quite blunt about it. At least the way the empire is working right now, that's where they would fit in. They can change that. I assume they will. Like you look at Shaz, the change one of the things that's great about Shaz is change a lot of the stuff that they did add there is actually accessible during the course of a campaign when it freaking matters. Not later on, once you've won the campaign, you are just grinding for the victory conditions. That's one of the things I would say. So maybe they change that. Uh, from my perspective, I, I don't know how the land ship is going to be. People are speculating on this on this particular subject. Is it a melee unit? Is it a ranged unit? Wait, no. Uh, I'm kind of wondering if they decide to add it because, you know, Mandalore Gaming made that point in his Warhammer 2 video. <laughs> but I don't know. Like, maybe that's something they wanted to add for a while. A lot of people have certainly wanted that. A land ship is essentially a steam tank that Marion Burke made. It's not 
as good as a steam tank, but steam tanks are supposed to be very rare. So maybe a land ship is a tier four unit as opposed to a tier five unit. Maybe they just work as a lesser version of the steam tank, but just more available. Steam tank who held blaster volley gun on it, really good. Like I don't use steam tanks in a campaign pretty much ever. They're just not like they're good at surviving damage, but they just don't do enough damage when I need them. If I want an artillery piece, I can get much better artillery pieces. And yeah, they're good for tanking some damage, but I got plenty of other options for that, like a lot of heroes as opposed to that are individually cheaper than a steam tank. I'd rather get the warrior priest than a steam tank for the sake of that. So that like there's just no reason for it. They don't do enough damage. Had the hell blaster volley gun to it. However, things do change. That's gonna be an infantry land mower, I, I imagine. That could be useful. As for known iron sides and Hawkland long rifles, gunpowder units just like if there's a tiny bump in the terrain, they won't shoot. Like that's how horrible it is right now in Warhammer 3. Don't get me started on freaking sieges and the pathfinding there and how useless they are. Thing it can be fixed, so hopefully they do fix it. But out of these two, is like it feels like known iron sides are probably just going to be a better handgunner unit, whereas Hawkland long rifles are going to be just zales for the empire, which would make them more effective. Uh, see, gunpowder units especially struggle at more medium ranges, but if you put a sniper, if you make a sniper gunpowder unit, that can be effective, can fit the same role as a Giselle, so that's probably what long rifles are going to use. And Knights of the Black Rose, uh, we'll see what they do, but another cavalry unit. See, I'm going to say what's missing over here, infantry units. Now, it's likely based on what we're reading over here about Elspeth that she will be able to make better infantry units because of her, all her upgrades but one of the significant issues for the Empire their entire melee infantry line is freaking terrible one way or another so everything and everything including spearmen swordsmen halberdiers are useless spearmen because they don't do damage they don't have the survivability, they'll just break. You have no reason, you should never recruit them. Recruit crossbowmen, recruit archers, recruit everything else. Get hero capacity. What about great swords? Those are decent enough. Yeah, but they're more expensive than better and cheaper. Uh, like, they're annoying to recruit because you need multiple buildings. They're more expensive than other units that are even stronger than they are and cheaper than they are significantly cheaper than they are, dependent on what you are, more readily available. So that's the problem. Like Spearman and Shields are good for flying protection. Halberdiers can be good at that, but they're just, again, too freaking expensive. Like essentially, like to give you an idea of fracking, uh, how crap Halberdiers are for uh, for the Empire right now, or all the infantry units of, of the Empire are right now, every single one of them loses to the new Kislevite warrior unit that was added for Shadows of Change for Kislev. And that's a tier one unit you can recruit from every settlement. Every single one of them. Maybe, you know, Zealots, maybe. Depends on a bit on the leadership, but they probably lose to that. Every single one of them except Great Swords. And it's not, and Great Swords, yeah, they'd win. Sure, they'd win. They're a much higher, higher tier unit. They're a tier three unit that requires an extra building to recruit, so they should win. But it is a problem. So I, I understand, look, I get it. It's a known focus DLC, so it under, makes perfect logical sense for known to have, uh, for a known focus DLC to have focus on gunpowder units. Problem is the way gunpowder units work, hopefully Creative Assembly fixes that. If they don't, uh, we'll see how that works. <laughs> we will see. Uh, don't get me wrong, I do think like it's going to be interesting with all the mechanics. Like I think Elspeth is probably going to make it work because she's probably going to be able to make those regular infantry units work better. But yeah, it's not necessarily going to be great for Carl Franz. And like it's really going to be uh, what they decide to do with the range combat situation is going to matter for that Master Engineer Lord. Like if I'm a player, like I, I just want to give this point. If I'm a player, I want the freaking reason as the Empire to recruit something other than Arch Lecters because there's literally no reason to ever like maybe some huntsman if you're making a full centric huntsman army maybe campaign movement range all the benefits that he gives to huntsman just very limited you're much better off in the vast majority of situations like 90 95 percent of situations an arch lector is beats the other two out of the water like just completely destroys them and if you're giving me a master engineer lord 
he bloody well be worth having because because he's at the moment if you added this lord like we have gunpowder heroes and they're not good like seriously consider the cast dwarf infernal castellan useless freaking hero the only reason you get infernal castellans is not for their combat ability it's for the mobility they give so sure you'll want engineering heroes but engineer lords not sold on that it might seem like i'm just complaining but i'm just pointing out the issues we don't know if Great Assembly has fixed them, whether or not they have fixed any of this. And that's really the, like, as I stated at the beginning, that's what's going to make or break this, this DLC for me. Have they fixed these other issues? If they have, great stuff. They're on the right path. They're so, certainly doing things they should have been doing months ago. If they haven't, it's not necessarily going to be pretty. I mean, a lot of people already, I should point this out, now, I'm not fond of just going by the flow of what people post on Reddit or Steam or that, but a lot of people are not necessarily happy. It's like, oh, why isn't there a Caster Lord option for the Empire? Why would I care about a Caster Lord option? Like, by the way, a Caster Lord option, if they had decided to go with that for the Empire, would have the same issue. Like, a Slayer Lord for the Dwarves? Yeah, okay. There's reasons you might want that. If he actually has Slayer benefits, right? That might make a Slayer army viable. Uh... Cast Lord option for Nurgle, okay, works perfectly fine. But an Engineer Lord, yeah. But what about Mage Lord? Why would, wouldn't that be better? Because you can get magic. You can get plenty of magic in an Empire campaign. You're not suffering from mages, I, I'm going to tell you that. The problem with the Mage Lord is that, yes, the magic is obviously powerful... But if you have plenty of magic in the Empire, it does have plenty of magic capacity. I mean, it could be useful early on in a campaign, but then I gotta ask, well, an Arch Lecter, the reason Arch Lecters are so good is because they're kind of a magical lord themselves. Like, they're pretty good in melee, they have abilities that are really solid, and don't cost any of the precious winds of magic. So that's one of the reasons Arch Lecters. So any lord that's coming in for the Empire has to be better than that. Has to offer something so very substantial that you have a reason. Now hopefully, what's not stated in all of this, but what I hope is that they've actually changed all of the hero... Uh, well, sorry, not the heroes. All their lore choices for both Empire and Dwarves in a way to make all of them good. Because right now... You don't care about anything other than rune lords for the dwarves. The other choice, like the dwarf lords, are not good. Demon slayers, obviously, if they buff slayers, they could be good. But it's like rune lords, yeah, I think I might go with that. For the empire, arch selectors just are much better than imperial general generals and all that. So it depends on what CA does with that. Like they really needed to update that. It is good that they did update the heroes of the dwarves, for instance, but they also need to update the heroes of the empire. So like imperial captains, warrior priests, witch hunters, all that, even imperial mages, they do need some extra skills because right now they're very basic. But yeah, I mean, what they're showing, like, I just want to finish this. What they're showing is not bad at all. Like, I think it's fairly solid. But what they're talking about, like, I'm not interested in new units, I'm interested in campaign mechanics, I'm interested in racial updates, I'm interested in how the campaigns are going to be, how the, how maybe Realms of Chaos map, uh, as a map is going to be. By the way, Realms of Chaos is getting really, really crowded at this point. Just going to say that. Now, where will all of these lords be? I don't know. Tamarkin could start next to Drazov, potentially. Might make sense in the Mountains of Morn. Um, Malachi, well, Spirit of Grungni did pretty much um, have a major role in your known, so that's why they're, that's why Malachi is part of this, and also known engineering, etc., all that. Elspeth should start in known, and I certainly hope we don't have the dual start situation. I've really soured on the idea of a dual start campaign as of late. It can be fun sometimes. Uh, by the way, I, I wish to say this about Elspeth. Her mechanic of the Gardens of Morn really reminds me of like, oh, we're just going to take Oxyatl's campaign mechanic, or maybe the Wood Elf one, one of those two, or a combination of those two, and put it in a campaign. Kind of sounds similar to Oxyatl, to be honest, because it's like you can build those hidden sanctums as, like, as Oxyatl. For Elspeth, you're probably only going to be able to do that in the Empire, but we'll see how all of this works out. Like, we need more information, right, for a definite conclusion. 
I'm cautiously optimistic. All in all, for all the things I've said in this video, I'm cautiously optimistic, but largely because people have stated that there's major racial updates, I'm cautiously optimistic, but we really need to get more info. Kostin Sanyat, stay tuned for more.